Welcome to Friday night service. Hallelujah. Welcome for those watching us online. Praise the Lord. Why don't we all rise? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a glorious day this is. What a memorable day it is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it's wonderful that we could be found in his house this night. Amen. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord. We just exalt your most holy name. We lift your name up high, Lord God, for you are worthy. You are worthy. You are the Lamb of God. You are the Lamb of glory. And we exalt your name this day. We thank you, Lord, for the joy set before you. You endured the cross. You endured scorn and shame, Lord God. Father, we just thank you, Lord God, for giving us Jesus, who was wounded for our transgressions, who was bruised for our iniquities. We just thank you, Lord, that the punishment for our peace was laid upon him, Lord God. And because of that, by his wounds, by his very stripes, each and every one of us here are healed. We're healed of all diseases. We're healed of all calamities. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And Father God, we just thank you, Lord. Because of the blood of Jesus, we have victory. Because of the blood of Jesus, death and sin have been conquered. And we just praise you, Lord God. We just praise you, Lord God, that we can stand here this night and say, it is finished. It is finished by the blood of Jesus. It is finished by his stripes. We just exalt you, Lord God. We just lift up your name, Lord God. And we just thank you, Lord, for your enduring mercy, for your enduring grace. In Jesus' name, we say amen and amen. Hallelujah, Lord. The song is called Ever Be because your love is devoted like a ring of solid gold vow that's been tested. Your love is devoted like a ring of solid gold, like a vow that is tested, like a covenant of old. Your love is enduring through the winter rain.
praise you, Lord. We're going to lift you up. We're going to magnify your name.
Hallelujah, Jesus. We worship you, Father God. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 Lord. Adventist Assembly of God, Harabos Santai, Lord, those who have needs of requests upon your hearts that they cannot mention, those who are sick, oh God, we pray in the name of Jesus, we say be healed in Jesus' name, from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet, we say be healed, hallelujah, we said you are the healed of the Lord in Jesus' name. Lord, those who need jobs, employment, we say the Lord, you said that it, that, that it, Lord, promotion doesn't come from the east or from the west, but it comes from you, oh God, we look to you. Lord, Lord, power belongs to you. 
you alone have the power. Lord, we thank you that you've surrounded your children with favor. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, for those who are going through financial situations. We pray, oh God, that your Holy Spirit, Lord, those who are going through family issues that they don't know where to turn, Lord, give them wisdom. Give them knowledge, dear Jesus. Father, we thank you for all you've done. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory be to Jesus. Glory be to Jesus. Lord, we pray for parents that you will strengthen them as they raise their children in the fear and the mission of the Lord. Hallelujah. We pray for caregivers, dear Jesus. Lord, that you will give us strength in them in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you. 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 We praise you. We praise you. We praise you. Hallelujah. Glory be to Jesus. Glory be to Jesus. Father, we thank you for leading us this far. And we know, oh God, that you will lead us. We say, Thy kingdom come in Venice Assembly of God. Thy will be done in Venice Assembly of God. We put away our selfish desires. We put away what we want to see. And we turn our eyes to you. And you say, Your will, Lord, is the only will we want in this Venice Assembly of God. We thank you for Pastor Mark. We pray you strengthen him, Mark Anthony. Lord, strengthen Mark Anthony and Erica as they take on this Venice Assembly of God. Lord, give them discernment. Give them wisdom, dear Jesus, as they lead us. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for all. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We give you the praise. We know you can do, you will do great things in our midst. In your name we pray. Amen and amen and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated in his presence. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Again, welcome to Friday night service. It's a good Friday. Hallelujah. A good Friday. Welcome to those watching us on live stream. Really, there's not many announcements except to say, on the third day he arose. That's my announcement. Hallelujah. 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 Tomorrow's a quiet day, so that means we all have to get ready, right? We have to get ready for Resurrection Sunday. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No excuses. We're not busy tomorrow, right? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So let's continue to worship. Are we ready to continue to worship? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that you afford us this time, Lord God, that we can continue to worship you, Lord God, without giving. We thank you, Lord, that you have supplied every one of our needs, Lord God. And we thank you, Lord, that we can give back to you. And we do so because we want to further the work of your kingdom, Lord God. So, Father, bless those who are able to give this night. Father, be with those that are not able to, Lord God. You know each and every person and what their needs are, Lord God. So, Father, we just entrust them to you, Lord God, this very night. And, Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give to you. And in Jesus' name we say amen. amen. Please come forth with your gifts. Well, I am blessed, I am blessed, I am blessed every day.
neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm blessed. here tonight. What a joy. What a joy. What a joy to be here this evening. Uh, I would encourage you to um, share the joy that you have with somebody this weekend. Share the joy that you have, the reason that we have for celebrating. Let's share that with someone. Uh, there should be, uh, I think Kwame exemplified it as he came on up, there should be an extra pep in our step this weekend because of the joy that we have, because of what Christ has done and what it means for us. Amen? Uh, before I dive into my message, I did want to share a personal note. Uh, I was on the phone with Pastor David Nazolo this week, and he just wanted to express a very, very, very heartfelt thank you, thank you, thank you, were his words, uh, for just the outpouring of love and support uh, as his family is just, you know, dealing with the passing of his father. Uh, that took place about two weeks ago now, a week or so ago. And so I was on the phone with him and he just said, please, he was like, please just, he was like, my gratitude falls short, but just express my gratitude, say thank you for me. And so I just want to relay that message. Uh, I, he's doing well, his family's doing well, but he has received cards. Uh, there were those of you who were present at the memorial service that they did for his father. And he, he was just taken back by, by the, the love and support from Van Ness Assembly of God. And I said, well, for all that you've done for the church, uh, I, I believe it's safe to say that it was the least that could be done. And, uh, and so we honor him, we honor his family, we honor his father's memory, but he just wanted to express his gratitude, amen? They're doing well because they have hope in Jesus. And because of the life that his father lived, they have that blessed assurance of, because of what Christ did, they know that his father is in, a, in the place that we all desire to be when our day comes, amen? And so we do not suffer like those who do not have hope. That's what the word says. And so we're able to um, mourn with those who mourn, but we're also able to have that, that hope and expectation of what's to come, amen? I wanna share a word this evening, this good Friday. Uh, for those of you who had the chance to be here today at the 12 o'clock service, there, there was a buffet that was brought forth uh, we had, yes, glory be to God. We had seven speakers who shared on the seven sayings of Christ. Uh, I believe it was live streamed. And so it, it was, amen. If you want to be blessed, you know, just uh, tomorrow, you know, Sister Dolores was saying that we're not busy. There's nothing going on. Uh, check out the YouTube channel and, and, and be blessed, be fed, be encouraged, be challenged by what was shared here today. Uh, I want to encourage you tonight as uh, we share this message, as I think about what was said today, uh, I really wanted to kind of go, um, kind of following the, the sequential order, if you will, on what took place on that fateful day in which Christ was crucified. And so I want to share a message called Not Far From The Kingdom. And I, I want to kind of draw our attention, if you will, to somebody that arguably we could perhaps say is a unsung hero. Uh, definitely a supporting character because Christ is the protagonist in this all. But there is a key person that I want to share about tonight that I believe will challenge us about how we engage with the crucifixion of Christ on the cross and, and what it means for us and what we can do because of what he's done on Calvary's cross. Amen. So I'm going to open up in a word of prayer. I'm going to share a couple of passages and then I'm going to highlight some things tonight. And I believe that the Lord has something for us all. Amen. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy. We thank you 
because today we can remember what you did on Calvary's cross. We can remember, Father God, the price that you paid. Lord Jesus, we thank you that as you said, it was finished. The work was finished, but it was just the beginning for us. It was the beginning of our entry into eternity. And we thank you because of the suffering that you endured. We thank you because of what you did, Lord Jesus. We can have life and life eternal. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the blessed hope and assurance for the, for the blood shed on Calvary's cross, Lord Jesus. We bless your name, O oh Father God. May your words speak to us tonight, and may we be challenged in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So I'm going to come out of Mark's gospel. I'm going to uh, read a couple of passages of scripture because there's a few that I want to highlight, and then uh, we're going to dive deep. So get your scuba suit on because we're going into it tonight, okay? Amen. Mark chapter 12, verse 30 says this. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Mind you, this was Christ's response to a scribe who was asking him, what is the greatest commandment? To this reply that he received from Christ, the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. A scribe, a master of the law. This was his response to the words of Christ. Truly, you are right. When Jesus heard this, Jesus said, you have answered wisely. You are not far from the kingdom of God. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. There's something powerful that takes place here in this passage of scripture. This scribe comes and he's engaging with Jesus about his teachings. He's putting them to the test, if you will. Yes, yes. A scribe who's a master of the law is asking him, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus responds, paraphrasing here, love God, love your neighbors. Amen. What we need to understand is that a scribe knew the law found in the Old Testament. It was their role, their responsibility to have it memorized, if you will. We have a hard time understanding parking laws. I don't know about you, but I've gotten my fair share of tickets because it says alternate side street cleaning, but then there's meter parking and then there's this and there's that. And sometimes you feel like you need a master's degree to be able to read the six signs on the post on the corner so that we know, is this okay to leave my car here? I only got to go in there for two seconds. I'm spending more time trying to decipher, and I don't even know what day of the week it is because I'm so tired from reading this thing. I don't know about you, but I pull out my phone to check the calendar. Bit. Is today Wednesday? I don't know. I know I'm the only one. You guys are far smarter than I am. But this guy was a master in the law. See, what we need to understand is that in the Old Testament, the law was 600 and 13 laws. 613. Again, I have a hard time with parking laws, let alone 613. David in Psalms took that and brought it down to 11. Micah in his word, when he wrote prophetically, he brought it down to three. And here Jesus, I, I love what Jesus did here. He keeps it simple. He brings it down to two things summarizes 613 laws in two things. Love God, love your neighbors. Now, he simplified it for us. It doesn't mean it's easy, but it is what he calls us to. And when this scribe, this master of the law, who has dedicated his life to memorize 613 laws, hears this response from Christ, my life's work, you just summed up in two phrases. <laughs> Everything that I've tried to understand and master, you have brought it down to these two things. Love God, love people. Love God, love my neighbor. 
And when he has this realization of the authority and the wisdom of Christ, he says, truly, you have answered correctly. And then it says, Christ, seeing that he answered wisely, says, you are not far from the kingdom. The question I want to pose tonight is, or the reality, rather, that I would like to call our attention to, is there are those outside who are not far from the kingdom. It is up to you and I to be willing to engage with them and have these conversations so that they could come to the realization of who Christ is. There are people who are not far from the kingdom. They are right there. But unless we introduce them to Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, they will not enter into the kingdom. But they are there. The harvest is plentiful, said Jesus. But the laborers are few. Are we willing to be laborers? Jesus says, pray to the Lord of the harvest for those laborers. There are people who are not far from the kingdom. I want to give emphasis to this, and I promise it's coming a good Friday. I'm, I'm getting there. I'm setting up a platform here. I'm setting up an argument because I want us to engage with a narrative that we find in the gospel, not just one passage. This man, this scribe, Jesus replied to him, you are not far from the kingdom. Love God, love people. Now here we find ourselves in Mark chapter 15. And it says this, verse 42. This passage in particular is also found in Matthew 27. If you're taking notes, it's also found in Luke chapter 23. It's also found in John chapter 19 because the detail of what is about to transpire, what we're going to focus on tonight is so crucial and so key to our Christian faith that each gospel writer knew that it had to be recorded. It is the burial of our Lord. And so here we find in Mark chapter 15, verse 42, it says this. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, some would argue perhaps a scribe, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have died already. We shared earlier today that there were those during that time that they would hang for days on the cross. Christ hung six hours, not because it was needed to be there any moment longer. He was fulfilling Old Testament law, Old Testament practices. He died at the precise hour that they would make the evening sacrifices before the Lord. Pilate was shocked. He was surprised, it says, to hear that he had already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. He, he wasn't believing this. So he asked the guy in charge, perhaps the guy who poked him or stabbed him in the side with his spear, perhaps the guy who was responsible for crushing a crown of thorns on his head. Is this true? Is he dead? Verse 45, and when he learned from the centurion that indeed he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of a rock and he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. You guys ready to dive deep? Because there's so much to be said here. There's so much to be said here. A member of the council comes before Pilate. Pilate's shocked. What we need to understand is that these were Jews that we're talking about here. It was the day of preparation for one of the high feasts, the most important feast, the Passover. And yet, this man, Joseph of Arimathea, accompanied by Nicodemus, was willing to intentionally defile themselves, become ceremonially unclean for the sake of honoring Jesus Christ. 
We need to understand that if we study the law, if we study Leviticus, if we study numbers, when you were to observe the Passover, you were to maintain the highest level of purity. Yet these men said, I'm willing to roll up my sleeves. I'm willing to get dirty. I'm willing to be ceremonially unclean so that I can honor this man named Jesus. This strikes me so powerfully because so many times we can say, well, no, 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 that's not how you do it. No, that's not how things are done. There's rules here. There's rules. There's laws. There's norms. There's this. There's that. These men in that moment said, no. I'm willing to defile myself for the sake of honoring that man's ministry, for honoring what he's done, for honoring the life that he had lived. But don't think I'm giving you license to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Don't think I'm giving you license to say, well, let, let's just disregard all rules, all laws, and let's just go crazy in the name of Jesus. Again, these were scribes. These were masters of the law. Members of the high council. See, they knew that in the law, there was, let's say, a provision. For those of you who do contractual work, there was a writer, there was a loophole. However you want to understand it, what you need to understand is that when the Passover was first instituted, and I'll give you the reference so you can read it yourself and make sure that I'm not making this up, but for time's sake, I'm not going to read the entire passage, but if you want to turn to Numbers chapter 9, you can read verses 6 through 11, and you will see for yourself that there were men who wanted to observe the Passover, but they come before Moses. They're not yet in the promised land, right? They are wandering through the desert, but they want to observe the Passover. And they say, hey, we're ceremonially unclean. We've come in contact with the dead. What do we do here? Moses says, paraphrasing, let me inquire of the Lord because your heart seems to be in the right place. So Moses inquires of the Lord, and the Lord grants provision because he saw their heart and said, they're ceremonially unclean now. They could participate next month. Read it for yourself. Being part of the high council, they knew this. They said, I'm willing to defy myself right now. I'm willing to roll up my sleeves, get my hands dirty, because I want to honor Jesus. But yet they were conscious of the fact that there was provision for them in the law to be able to do such a thing. So they weren't being entirely dismissive. They were understanding within their context, within their situation, within their moment, how can we do what Jesus is calling us to do? How can we honor this man named Jesus? Yet, while they were consciously defiling themselves so that they would not be able to participate in the Passover, what does it say? They wanted to honor the Sabbath. It was the day of preparation. They had a sense of urgency because although they were foregoing participating in the Passover, they said, no, nope, but we're going to honor the Sabbath. We're going to be done before the Sabbath laws go into effect. See, so they weren't completely being dismissive. No, no, no. They were understanding how can we, with within is given to us, work around so that we can do the thing that honors Christ. But in order. There are moments in which we will find ourselves in a precarious situation, an unorthodox encounter, and we could easily walk away and wash our hands and say, no, no, because that's not how things are done. You don't minister to people in a crack house. You don't go inside a gay club. You don't do this. You don't do that. But you know what? If you're being led by the Spirit, did not Jesus associate with prostitutes? Did not Jesus associate with the greatest sinners of his day? A tax collector, if we're going to contextualize it to today, someone who was oppressing his people financially and otherwise, we could equate them to a drug dealer. Somebody who was robbing the very neighbors. I promise you today, Jesus would dine at a table with a drug dealer. We could say, no, 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 not my Jesus. Contextually, in his time, tax collector was just as bad. But yeah, he did it with wisdom. 
He had his disciples with him. So there's ways to do these things. It's not just that we get all crazy and we just say, caution to the wind, I'm going to go crazy for Jesus. They're aware that they were foregoing participating in the Passover right there in that moment, but they still wanted to honor the Sabbath. There are certain things that are hard, fast, black and white, yes and no. But then there are things in which we got to say, Lord, give us the creativity, the understanding, the wisdom, so that we can honor you in this moment, albeit an unorthodox situation. They had the foreknowledge to be able to perceive this. And we can easily overlook this. We can easily read past this. But we need to think about these were Jewish men who came before Pilate. Give us the body of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to understand what Jesus taught. Perhaps these were words that they heard. Perhaps these were words that impacted their life. But I want to call your attention to Mark chapter 7, verse 21, where Jesus said, when he was challenged by the Pharisees and Sadducees about why do the disciples not wash their hands? They're ceremonially unclean. Jesus replied, for from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. It's not who you come in contact with. It's the stuff that cannot be seen. It's the stuff that's what's inside of you. You can project the nice facade. You could come to church Easter Sunday, and I pray you do, wearing your Sunday best. And inside, you can have your Monday worst going on. You could be like the Pharisees. He said, they pay attention to washing the outside of the cup. They know when to say, hallelujah, praise the Lord. They know how to do a dance as they come down the aisle to give their offering. But their hearts are far from me. But their hearts are far from me. But then there are those who want to say, Lord, you see my heart, and I want to honor you. Give me wisdom and creativity for this moment. People may look at us and judge. Say, why is that guy going into that person's house? What is she doing hanging out with the likes of them? And we can easily say, well, if they see me hanging out with the drug dealers, they're going to think I'm a drug dealer. Oh, if they see me hanging out with the prostitutes, they're going to think I'm a prostitute. Granted, we do not throw caution to the wind. We use wisdom. But it's not that we are not willing to draw near to them for the sake of sharing the good news of the gospel. Because perhaps even they, even they are not far from the kingdom of God. Love God, love your neighbor. We choose to recognize the God who chose us. But let me tell you something. We do not choose our neighbors. And yet we are still called to love them. We are still called to love them. I wanted to call your attention to the reality that this was also took place to fulfill prophecy. Probably figured out by now, Isaiah 53 is one of my favorite chapters because I reference it a lot. But Isaiah 53 verse 9 says this, And they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. You know what it is to have a grave, to have a tomb that you are just willing to lend? See, where my family's from in Cuba, my father talked about when my grandfather passed away of prostate cancer. He died in about 1995. About three years later, my father had to go back and dig up his father's bones so that the next family member had a place to be buried. He had to exhume his own father and dig up the bones so that the plot could be used for the next family member that would have need of it. And yet, here we are, we see Joseph of Arimathea, and we can look over the fact that he had a tomb which he was willing to give. As Isaiah 53, he was given a grave with the rich. Though in life, on this earth, he had nowhere to lay his head. 
But this detail is so crucial because how can we celebrate the empty grave, the empty tomb, if there was no tomb? Think about this. Crucifixion, death by crucifixion, this, let's say, capital order, capital punishment, it was such a common practice. They didn't think twice when they broke the legs of the thieves that they were hanging behind Christ. Had these men not come before Pilate to ask for the body of Jesus, they would have tossed his corpse like anybody else. And then the claim of a resurrection, well, it would have been so much more challenging to attest that. But because we have a tomb, because we have an empty tomb, because we know that he was buried, because we know where he was buried, because the women knew where to go that Sunday morning, we can attest with confidence that our Christ indeed is rose from the grave. But had Joseph of Arimathea gotten caught up and said, what are they going to say about me? I'm a member of the high council and I'm not going to participate in Passover. What are they going to say about me? What are they going to think of me? Had he entertained that foolishness? Who knows? But because he had boldness. What did it say in the verse that we read? It says in verse 43, he took courage. He took courage. Do you know what it is to present yourself before the governing official of your day and age to say, the man that you just executed, I need his body. He took courage. He used his resources. He used the clout that he had in society as a member of the council. But with boldness, he went before him. Now, something that we need to understand here is this. He took a step of faith. He didn't have it all figured out. How do we know that? Because it's after, after he was given the body, after he was given consent and permission from Pilate, afterwards it says is when he bought the linen shroud. He took a step of faith. He didn't have it all figured out. But he knew he had to act with urgency. Let me go before Pilate and we'll figure out everything else afterwards. He didn't say, no, let me go shopping first. And if I get to Burlington, if I get to TJ Maxx and they got a sale on linens, maybe, then maybe I could do the thing. I'm going to test you, Lord. What the fleece? Dry the fleece. I'm going to go to, you know, Target and see what they got in the sales section. And if there's a ram in the thicket on the very bottom aisle, in the very bottom row, then I'll know that you're with me. And then I'll know that I'm supposed to buy this linen and go before Pilate and ask for the body. He didn't have time. He wanted to honor the Sabbath. So he took courage and said, I got to act now. I got to act now. I got to move now. I'll figure out the rest later. I know that I need to honor this man named Jesus because the life that he lived, he's worthy of a decent burial. He's worthy to be honored in life and in his death. He's worthy. And I don't care what anybody says about me. I'm going to do what I got to do to honor Jesus. He took courage. He went before Pilate. He asked for the body. It says after he asked, then he went shopping. He took responsibility. He didn't just say, okay, I'm going to use my status in society. I'm going to use the clout that I have as a member of the high council, and I'm going to ask for the body, but it's up to y'all to figure it out. You know, I did my piece. I spoke with Pilate. Now you guys go figure it out. No. He went, he bought the linen shroud. And then it says that he got the spices in accordance to their burial customs. He took responsibility in how he was going to honor Christ in that moment. My Lord, can we take courage in the day and age in which we're living for the sake of honoring Christ? Can we take responsibility? What we need to understand is that he died for our guilt. So responsibility is not synonymous with guilt. Because I take responsibility for a situation does not mean that I am at fault. It means that I care enough to do something. It means I care enough to do something. It means I care enough to roll up my sleeves, get my hands dirty, defile myself, dare I say, so that the name of Jesus can be honored 
and glorified. He took courage. He took responsibility. And as he took responsibility, he took action. He did something. Him and Nicodemus, as the other gospel accounts say, they lowered him with that shroud. Could you imagine that moment in which Christ's lifeless body was embraced by Nicodemus as he lowered him from that cross? Nicodemus, who in John chapter 3 had the one-on-one -on -one conversation that we quote on a regular basis. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomever shall believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Mind you, this was a one-on-one -on -one conversation that was happening under the cloud of night, under the cover of night. Why? Because it says that Nicodemus, out of fear of the others, he was a secretive follower of Christ. But on that day, he stepped out in boldness. It wasn't in secret. He stepped out and said, let whomever see me know that this man's blood is on my clothes because I am coming in contact with the broken body of Jesus Christ so that we can honor him in his burial. Joseph of Arimathea, which we do not know, I'm speculating when I present that perhaps he was described in Mark chapter 12. We don't know that for certain, but it is plausible to think that he had heard the teachings and words of Jesus Christ. But regardless of whatever interaction he had or did not have, whatever is recorded or not recorded, what we do see is he had a level of boldness that no apostle had in that moment. Did not Peter deny Christ because they recognized his accent and said, are you not a Galilean? I know what it is to be recognized by my accent. I have friends when we were living in Spain, British people. Sometimes it was easier for us to talk in Spanish to one another. Can you believe that? She couldn't understand my accent. Whenever I got asked to translate at church, they were like, oh, it sounds like Joey from Friends. <laughs> and I could say, no, I ain't from New York. I, only, I, I, can't, I don't even know how to pronounce coffee any other way than saying coffee. <laughs> I've tried so hard. But we are known by our accent. We are known by the way that we speak. And there's no way that you can hide it. Yet Peter in that moment tried saying, no, no, no. I'm not from Galilee. No, no, no. I'm not his follower. No, no, no. I do not know him. Yet as he was presented before the very council that would declare him worthy of death, there were two men that were present that said, this man is innocent. This man is innocent. There were two men that could perceive he's doing this for me. They took courage, they took responsibility, and they took action. And in doing so, the word of God was fulfilled. He was given a grave with the rich. And because of the boldness of Joseph of Arimathea, we can read what we will celebrate on Sunday, Mark 16, 3. And they asked each other, who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? No Joseph of Arimathea, no tomb. No stone to be rolled away. Please hear me. I do not give emphasis to Joseph of Arimathea to take away from Christ the glory that he is due. But what I want you to engage with and interact with was that he was so compelled by the cross. He was so compelled by the cross that he was willing to do what no one else was. He was so compelled by the life and ministry of Jesus Christ that he said, I'm willing to get my hands dirty. They could say whatever they want to say about me. I am going to ask for his body. I'm going to prepare him for burial. I'm going to give him my resources. What I have, I'm going to give him my tomb. They were all shocked that Sunday morning when the tomb was found empty. What we need to appreciate is that Joseph of Arimathea wasn't saying, yeah, I'll just lend it to you for the weekend. 
because I know that's all you need it for. No, no, he could not perceive that that was the case. He did so saying, have it as long as you need it. That which is mine, have it as long as you need it. Jesus resurrected. And that which Joseph gave was given back to him. I don't know what that means for you. I don't know whose opinion you're more concerned about. I don't know that inner wrestle that you may have of what are they going to say about me? What are they going to think if I approach so-and-so? But I want to tell you something. If we celebrate another Good Friday and we think about the cross and we don't allow it to compel us to take courage, to take responsibility, and to take action, my God, my God, help us. May we be encouraged and inspired by the man Joseph Arimathea. I'm going to ask Brother Michael to come join me at the piano. This man was willing to break the laws of his day. But knowing that there was provision within those laws. But he still wanted to honor the Sabbath. He wasn't being completely dismissive of everything. He used his status in society to be able to call audience with Pilate. Let's arguably say it was a last minute meeting. If Eric Adams is getting ready to leave City Hall, and I show up when the day is coming to a close and I say, hey, I need to talk to you real quick. It's an urgent matter. I know I won't get audience. I don't even have to go that far. If I go and speak with the borough president, I know I won't get audience. Joseph Arimathea was able to get audience with Pilate. But he didn't just leverage that. For his sake, he did it when it mattered. To honor Christ. He didn't have it all figured out. He just knew that he had to honor Jesus. Afterwards, he went and got the shroud. Afterwards, he did it. But let me understand something. Let us all understand something. He took the initiative, but he did not do this alone. He recruited Nicodemus. Let's say they were in this together. Because to honor the man Jesus, to take him down, his physical body, broken body off that cross, it took two men. They also had the women who were there with them, with the spices, to prepare his body. It was a collective effort to honor Jesus in his death and burial. There are no lone rangers for Jesus. We can say, no, but they don't understand my calling, my anointing, How can we ever understand if, like the Ethiopian eunuch said, how can I understand if no one explains it to me? Why don't you invite someone so that they could see the thing that burdens your heart, so that they could see the thing that keeps you up at night, the people that you shed tears for on behalf of the Lord? Why don't you invite them so they can see? And perhaps they'd be willing to collaborate with you if you were willing to invite them along with you. He had Nicodemus. He had the women. He wasn't doing this on his own. But compelled by the cross, compelled by the life and ministry and teaching of Jesus Christ, he knew he could not just sit idly by. I'm going to ask if you stand to your feet this evening. There are those who are not far from the kingdom that the Lord has entrusted to us. The Lord has entrusted us to love them. The Lord has entrusted us with our neighbors and he has called us to love them. And in loving them, oh, there might be some that might criticize you because some of your neighbors might live an alternate lifestyle. Some of your neighbors might participate in illicit, illegal activity. 
Yes, I understand we're not called to be friends with the world. We are in this world and not of it. I understand that. I'm not dismissing that. But I am saying, even for the vilest person that we think we know, Jesus died for them too. And his blood shed on Calvary's cross has the power to redeem them, same as it redeemed you and me. Can we love our neighbors? Can we be compelled by the teachings of Jesus Christ? Can we be compelled by his greatest act of love and redemption, what he did on the cross, and say, Lord, help me to take courage. Lord, help me to take responsibility. Help me to take action. Because there are those who are not far from the kingdom. Can we pray tonight? Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you did on Calvary's cross. We thank you for the example that we can find in Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. We thank you, my God, that they were willing to use wisdom, to exercise creativity, Lord, to use their resources, both non-material and material for the sake of honoring you in your death and burial. And because they did, oh Lord, we can celebrate with confidence. We can rejoice with certainty of your resurrection from that empty tomb. My God, their action brought fulfillment to your word. May we take action that brings fulfillment to your word and the lives of others. Because your word tells us it is your desire that none should perish. And for that reason, you died on Calvary's cross. Lord, may the cross compel us to take courage, to take action, to take responsibility for those who are not far from the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I don't know about you, but I'm excited about Sunday. I have expectancy in my heart for a Sunday. I'm believing somebody's life is going to be changed on Sunday. And I'm believing that we all have the privilege of collaborating in that effort. We can collaborate in our prayers from here to Sunday. We collaborate by inviting someone we collaborate by, even if no one that I invited shows up, let me be that warm, welcoming face to that new person that someone else invited. We collaborate by creating an environment, a community in which those who will come to Christ can thrive and flourish. They may not be polished on the outside. They may not dress like you or like me. They may have things that they need to work out. But let's not forget that we all do. Let's not forget for a second that he is still perfecting us and sanctifying us. His work on the cross is finished, but his work in me is not. Because as long as I'm here on this earth, he is still at work in me. So let us not forget that anyone who can step foot in here, same as them, my righteousness is like filthy rags. I am saved by grace and grace alone so that I may never boast. Let us not think for a second that we are more worthy than anyone else for the price that Christ paid on Calvary's cross. He deemed us worthy. We are called to live worthy of the sacrifice he made, but not to live as if we were worthy of the sacrifice. Let's be encouraged tonight. I pray that you've been challenged by this word. I pray that this perhaps different perspective on Joseph of Arimathea and what took place that evening that Christ was crucified and buried. I pray it's stirring you a sense of urgency like Joseph of Arimathea had to say, somebody not far from the kingdom, Lord, help me to take courage, take responsibility, and take action. Would you lead us in a moment of worship, my brother? And then I'll come back and close this out tonight.
done on earth as it is in heaven our God Lord Jesus you did not come to be served but to serve and to give your life as a ransom for many you came to seek and to save the lost thank you Lord Jesus that because of the finished work on Calvary's cross Lord Jesus we are found 
in your mercy. We are found in your grace. We are found as sons and daughters before our Heavenly Father. Oh, Lord Jesus, but there are those who are still wandering. There are those who are still lost. There are those who are not far from the kingdom. My God, may we be mindful of them tonight, this weekend. Oh, Lord Jesus, especially. But always may you put a burden in our heart for the lost. Your desire is that none shall perish. Lord Jesus, help us to see your kingdom curve, to see your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we love you and we thank you. We thank you. Can you just thank Jesus for the cross tonight? Can you just thank Jesus for the cross? Where would I be? Where would I be? I don't want to try and imagine my life without Jesus. I don't want to try to imagine my life without the knowledge and understanding of what he did for me. I don't want to forget, yes, my sin is casted into the sea of forgetfulness in God's eyes, but I do not want to forget where he brought me from. I do not want to forget. Yes, my stains are washed and clean white as snow, but I do not want to forget that I was stained. I do not want to forget that while yet a sinner, Christ died for me. He didn't wait for me to get it right. He didn't wait for me to turn a corner. He did not wait so that I could change my lifestyle. It was not my change that provoked in him the desire to die for me. It was his love. It was his love for me. And as John wrote in his letter, we know love because we know the love of the Father. And because he loved us, we can love others. My God, thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for Calvary's cross. Thank you for the price that you paid. Thank you for the suffering that you endured. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your shed blood. Thank you for redeeming me, oh God. Thank you, my God. Thank you. Thank you, God. Where would I be without you, Lord Jesus? Where would I be without you, Lord Jesus? Lord, before you came to me, I was an enemy to that cross. I stood condemned in my sin. But you saw me. You attributed to me value. You redeemed me. You said I was worth saving. I was worth dying for. You endured torture, shame, embarrassment, humiliation. You endured. You took my place so that I could be adopted into the family. But yet you don't treat us as adopted children. No, you call us co-heirs. You call us co-heirs. My God, thank you that because of what you did, we can enter boldly before the throne of grace, before our Father in heaven. Oh God, thank you. Thank you for the cross, my God. May the cross compel us to take courage. May the cross compel us to take responsibility. May the cross compel us to take action because there are those that are not far from the kingdom. Lord, for my brothers and sisters who are present here tonight, for those who are joining us online, Lord Jesus, may we draw ever closer to you. May we find ourselves more in love with you today than the day that we were saved. Lord, may our love for you grow. And in that overflow of love, oh Lord Jesus, may we find ourselves more equipped with a greater desire to not just simply love God, but to love our neighbors as well. Put a love in our heart for the unlovable, oh God. Oh Lord, for those who are hard to love, Lord Jesus, put a love in our heart for them. Soften our hearts to them, oh God. Lord, because you saw them worth dying for. Thank you, Lord Jesus.
bless my brothers and sisters present here tonight as we reflect on the cross, as we allow it to challenge us. Lord, may the cross every day continue to change our life because of what you did on it. And may that realization of the empty tomb, oh Lord, may it empower us to draw others near because there are those that are not far from the kingdom. We bless your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give the Lord a clap off for tonight? <laughs> Hallelujah. God is so good. He is so good. God bless you tonight. May you make it home safely. May we walk out in victory and boldness because of who Christ is and what he's done. And let's celebrate this weekend. The finished walk of Calvary's cross. God bless you. Amen.